Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Prime Talk. My name is Lisa Kinski, and I'm joined by my ho- co-host, Yoni Mazur, and our guest today, Ritu Java. Ritu, how are you doing? Hey, Lisa. Hi, Yoni. Good to be here. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you so much for joining us. So Ritu is the CEO and co-founder of PPC Ninja, a leading Amazon PPC automation software that also provides managed services to help Amazon sellers navigate towards better returns on their ad dollars. So Ritu, we're very excited to have you here. This is going to be the Ritu Java hour, the only one in the world, as I just learned a little (laughs) bit ago. We're going to start with where you were born, your experiences growing up, where you went to university, and your professional stations of life until where you are today in e-commerce. Commerce. So uh, hi, with PPC you. Ninja, of course. So let's yeah. go ahead and jump straight in. Where are you from, dear? This is so exciting. Um, yeah, so I am uh, from Delhi, India. I was born in uh, Delhi uh, a long time ago, and I probably don't want to date myself, but this was <laughs> the previous century. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, I've been uh, you know in the e-commerce space for the past 10 years, but yes, my journey started off in India, and I've actually lived and worked in four countries. Uh, so India, Japan, uh, United States, and then uh, Canada. I live in Canada now, uh, and I'm waiting for my citizenship uh, due anytime. So, yeah, that's nice. Experience. A lot to unpack here. A lot to unpack here. But yeah. I do want to quickly just ask quickly because you mentioned Delhi. Yeah. I mentioned you didn't say New Delhi. I assume it's the same place, right? You know, it is uh, kind of the same place. It's almost like uh, New Delhi was uh, created after Delhi. So Delhi is now referred to as Old Delhi. So New is the one that's kind of eaten up not only Delhi, but it's also eaten up a bunch of like other satellite cities and it's just uh, growing. But is it the same geographical and... area? Both it of them? is the same. Yeah. New Delhi is like. I know there's a nuance to... there. There's a reason yeah, why you said Delhi, not confusing. New Delhi. Smart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, smart. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, Delhi is a growing city. Like, like it's growing. Um, I don't know. It's it's crazy. It's just engulfing all the smaller cities around it because it is the metro capital of India. And so a lot of people kind of flock to Delhi for work and uh, business and, you know. It's a capital it's, city, but it involves more in the politics of India because uh, I know like yes. um, uh, B- Bombay or Mumbai, I'm not sure how they call it today, is more the yeah. business like the New York area of, of India. Exactly. Yeah. So Delhi is the seat of the government and uh, Mumbai or Bombay uh, is where all the fun stuff happens. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah, it's uh, always a comparison between Washington, D.C. This is like, you know, the capital of the United States and the capital of all the politics and the government. Uh, New York is the business city, which in, in general, I think New York is a more fun city. It's uh, more fun, uh, yeah. I agree. Yeah, so I guess uh, <laughs> more business, more pleasure. I guess that's the yes, kind of combination. I more agree. government, less pleasure. <laughs> totally. Uh, hey, it's so funny because, uh, you know, when you say government, there's also uh, things like protests and stuff that happen, you know, in a, in the capital city, a lot true, of them, you know, and true. it's also the place where lots of maybe terrorism happens. I mean, uh, you know, growing up in India, we had so many kind of terrorist threats and all kinds of like, um, scary, dangerous, uh, situations, volatile that, uh, situations yeah, and, oh, yeah. and, and all, disruptions of life. Yeah. Yes. All the time. So yeah, it is kind of an important city, but it's also where all the interesting action takes place. <laughs> got it, got it. Okay, so very interesting. So uh, uh, um, growing up in new in, in old Delhi, right, <laughs> as opposed to new Delhi, um, uh, your parents, what kind of industries were they involved with? Were they also in like politics or government or anything? Um, my mom, uh, she was a doctor. And my dad was a university professor. So he was a professor in uh, chemistry. So he, he taught organic chemistry. And my mom, of course, uh, yeah, she was a doctor. And, uh, general doctor or specialist? She was a generalist. Yeah, she was mm-hmm. a generalist, okay. uh, like a family physician type of doctor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, nice yeah. Siblings? So, um, I have two. So I have a brother and a sister, both younger to me. I'm the oldest. Um, and uh, of course, in India, we have very large families. Um, like my cousins are like, I don't know, in the 50s or 60s. I don't know. I've lost <laughs> track oh, wow. of how many cousins I have. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, 50 plus cousins, you're saying. Yeah, 50 plus cousins, yeah. And we keep in touch, you know, that's the the good thing about India. uh, You can create your own social media just from your cousins. Yes, we have our WhatsApp, right? Yeah, we have our own WhatsApp group just for my cousins Mm -hmm. and another WhatsApp group just with aunts uh, and uncles and things like that. So it's it's cool because India, you know, people are generally um, very family-oriented and they like to kind of uh, stick together 
uh, somewhat like um, Mexico. I'm not sure. Um, I might be uh, mixing up cultures here a little bit, but yeah, you know, the Spanish culture, the Indian culture, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on family. And, uh, you know, to this day, we're like uh, going to each other's weddings and, you know, we're going to the kids' weddings and, you know, remembering birthdays and things like that. Weddings so, are a week long, if I'm not mistaken. One right? week, yes. That's the big fat Indian wedding. You know a lot, Yoni, about <laughs> India. Um, yeah, I'm friendly. I have a few uh, you know, good Indian friends. So, uh, okay. I picked up on, on a few nice. uh, elements, uh, which is cool. At least to think about it, when you get married, you don't have to plan for a few hours. You have to plan for plan for uh, plan for a whole week. Oh, I've, I've, I've thought I've thought about it before. Uh, you were in the plan, event business. You were in the. I'm yeah, you I because... used to plan weddings on the side. Believe me, <gasps> oh, I've thought no. about that. <laughs> no way! Oh my goodness, that is yeah. so exciting. Yeah, no, I think uh, if if you go to India and attend one of those weddings, it is something uh, you know to to really enjoy. I mean, it's um, you know there's different events on different days. Like people dance a lot. There's a singing day, a dancing day. Uh, the actual wedding day, a re reception day, and very kind, colorful, you know, also all the colorful. colors. Yeah, gold, love gold. We <laughs> Indians love gold. <laughs> that's great. Okay, so when you're growing up, besides partying a lot, it sounds like, uh, which is good family fun. Uh, um, what you were, you know, what were, what was your focus on, like academics, uh, sports, uh, making money? What was your focus? Yeah, it's so interesting. You know, in India, uh, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, academics. Mm -hmm. uh, we are encouraged to stay away from sports, actually, you know, which is weird. Like, I think about it. I'm like, why? Even would rugby? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> we, like, literally, you know, India. OK, so the guys, the boys, they will play cricket. You know, that's the mm -hmm. national sport, right? So Sorry, I meant cricket. I you forgot. I was about to say, it's yeah. cricket, right? It's like, cricket. what is rugby? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> even cricket? Yeah, even cricket? Yeah. Well, yeah, so girls. Girls will not play cricket. I mean, now maybe a few will. But, uh, you know, growing up, it was mostly like, you know, girls do um, uh, housework and they uh, they study, uh, and become doctors. <laughs> uh, so that's the kind of, um, you know, social setting in which I kind of grew up. And um, uh, it was, um, I was terrible at sports. Like I would, I barely did any sports. Like the, the most I would have done is like a hundred meter sprint or something like that. Uh, but for the most part, I was like, a, 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 you know, buried in my books all the time. Like I was studying and just aiming for the next exam and the next exam. So, um, yeah, growing up, you know, grades matters, uh, mattered a lot, you know, so I, I was studious and I was like, yeah, always busy with uh, some exam or the other. Okay, were were you good. interested in either being a doctor or a professor looking at your parents and the examples yeah. they said? You know, so I wasn't attracted to being a doctor, but uh, I thought that if not doctor, then the next uh, option is engineer, which I ended up becoming. So I went to engineering college uh, and um, that, in Delhi? Yeah, in Delhi. Yeah, I mm -hmm. went I went to one of the engineering colleges there. Uh, and um, it's, it's interesting because, you know, in India, they have like two or three very uh, kind of covetable uh, professions. Uh, one is definitely uh, doctor, second one is engineer, third is government official, which is kind of very interesting because apparently um, the reason why being a government official is very attractive is because once you're signed on, then they don't throw you out. You're, fire, they can't fire you. They can't fire you. Yeah, you're, you've got a job for life. And so it's kind of synonymous with uh, stability and, yeah. you know, a, a, a pension uh, that, you know, even after retirement, you'll just get taken care of. Is uh, the general population kind of happy with the status or they have a feeling like maybe this can kind of breed into corruption or, you know, complacency where the government is really not moving and not dynamic uh, in order to uh, and serve the, the citizens in the right way? Is there any friction on that? Because you come from the city of protest, so I'm wondering. Yeah, no, you're so right about this, Yoni. It does bring in a, a lot of complacency, especially once people get into those uh, positions, because then there's bribery and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. Which isn't really nice. And uh, in order to get any of them to move, you've got to pay under the table, uh, you know? Like, and mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, yeah, will I they get fired for bribery if they really, it's now they, they will. get caught? They will. Yeah, now okay, they will. Before, yeah. No? before okay. no. It was a pretty corrupt and, you know, dysfunctional kind of system. 
system for a while. And I think things have improved quite a bit. People also are more aware. They're proactively saying no to bribes. They're saying, you know, mm -hmm. we're going to do it the hard way. It doesn't matter. We'll stand in line. We won't cut the line, that kind of thing. Uh, oh, nice. But yeah, I mean, things change. Yeah, people uh, people learn, people grow, get influenced by the West and other, other cultures and have definitely uh, seen that uh, happen, that transformation happen in India as well. Okay, that's good gotcha. to hear. Okay, so you go to school, you get your engineering degree, and what's next? What's the next station for you? Um, yeah, so I got into, um, you know, as soon as I got out of college, I got uh, into a tech company. So, and I, I worked there for like 14, 15 years. Uh, in, in, the, in Old Delhi also? Uh, this was New Delhi, so New Delhi. And at New this Delhi, point, yeah. you know, the lines between Delhi, Old Delhi, New Delhi have blurred completely. It's all one thing. We, we just <laughs> refer to it as Delhi. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I went to uh, one of the tech uh, companies, that, one of the top tech, tech companies in, in India and worked there. Uh, you mind mentioning the name? <clears throat> no, no problem. Yeah, it's uh, NIIT, which is uh, one of the premier kind of software and education uh, companies in india and it trains a lot of the uh, you know engineers that you see everywhere like the tech uh, people that are everywhere uh, so mm -hmm. uh, yeah that's the, that's one of the, the the premier institutes for training uh, you know students on uh, just tech to topics right so they learn java java coding and my name is my last name is java and people used to think that i'm a, a <laughs> programmer i'm not a programmer uh, but um yeah so we used to teach those uh, you know those uh, subjects and topics um, and we also used to kind of do um uh, offshore uh, software development for foreign companies. And as part of my job, I actually came to the United States in a long time ago, actually, I, I don't even remember, late 90s, um, uh, for an assignment at uh, IBM. Uh, and that's when I you know, stepped into America and I was like, oh my God, this place, oh my goodness. It was like, <laughs> just so different i was just blown away uh, by this uh, the the whole uh, american dream and uh, all that stuff it was just so fascinating and i have always wanted to come back you know uh, it was a short trip it was just about 6 to 8 months i think i uh, went back which, and I, which area were you where, in yeah where did you go you know i went to atlanta georgia oh hey. uh, yeah <laughs> That's what my like it, yeah. first, yeah, yeah first, uh, you know, step into U.S. was in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I loved it. I well, just... done, Lisa. And first impression, team. <laughs> yeah, time. for real. I, I mean, it's I, I love Atlanta. I, I always tell people, come visit my beautiful city, experience it, but then please go home because we are full. <laughs> There's too many people here already. The traffic is horrendous. Um, yeah. oh but in I, I, I don't have memory of it, but just even growing right. up, like Atlanta in the 90s was even so different than it is now. Atlanta in right. 2010 is so different than it is now. Mm -hmm. um, right. But yeah. but I was I was curious where you said that you had such a culture shock between India and the US. I'm like, well, where were you? Like in New York or like- So even New Yorkers get culture or... shock in Atlanta. So. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. It's very different. <laughs> Yes, I, I didn't know, Lisa, you were from Atlanta. So are you still in Atlanta? Is that where yeah. you are? Oh, that's yeah. so cool. Oh, my God. I know. I love it. I, I have zero I intentions of it. leaving. I'm outside oh. of the city, though. I'm east mm -hmm. of the city now, and I'm east. from north of the city. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. No, that was beautiful. And, you know, one of the early impressions, uh, you know, on my kind of impressionable uh, young mind that time was that, oh, my goodness, um, these bottomless fries. Oh, my goodness. I used to be just so... <laughs> enamored by the, the amount of food you know it's like these plates they are just bottomless like i yeah. used to go to red robin and it was like i think it was red robin i'm not sure one mm -hmm. of those places where you get as many fries and as much coke and i was like oh my god this is crazy yeah. <laughs> abundance, um, the abundance yeah abundance right so and coming from india this was like um I mean, I never thought about the the health aspects of you know eating fries and coke back then. I was like, oh my god, this is a great deal. <laughs> 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 That's all I could think of, and you know, and I did put on a little bit of weight at that time uh, uh, because I was like, just I don't know what I was eating. Gosh, I I, I feel embarrassed uh, even to think about it. But anyway, so yeah, my my first impressions of America was beautiful, big country, clean, you know, convenient, lots of great food and amazing people. Like, you know, they actually say hello to you. <laughs> it's just amazing. Um, so yeah, so I think those were- So let's, I want to kind of reconnect yeah. into after college when you start with, it was NIIT, correct? Yes, NIIT. And what year was that when you started? I guess you started your professional career. 
Yeah, so it was in the 90s. I started my professional 95 career. 95 or 99? Or <laughs> so he's going to date me, huh? <laughs> no, we're going to yeah. put, we're going to slap um, the, the chronology in this. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say it was early 90s. <laughs> early 90s? Okay, yeah, good. Early 90s, yeah. So early 90s, and you're there yeah. for, you said about, what was it? Over 10 yeah, years, you mentioned. So, yeah, years. And, yeah, almost 10 years. And then I, uh, you know, I moved to Japan. Uh, that was my next life, you know, because. And why year was um, that, the move, when you shifted? It, it was uh, early 2000s. I moved to Japan and uh, I just, it was another culture shock. You know, I had seen the West, now I was going to the East. It was just. And what so triggered the move? What, what was the yeah. catalyst? Um, yeah, it was work actually. So there was um, some, um, you know, an opportunity to go there and um, I was able to kind of um, continue working for NIIT in Japan. So, uh, you know, the, there was like a satellite office there and I kind of helped to develop that a little bit with, um, you know, some sales and um, sale, pre, pre-sales kind of uh, business development kind of roles. Um, and I learned to speak Japanese. That was my first kind of, um, you know, um, interesting, uh, you know, you know, experience with Japan because uh, everything was in Japanese you know you 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 had to communicate or have an interpreter with you all at all times you know because they don't mm-hmm. speak English um, now it's a lot better because uh, people have you know started speaking English and everything you know signs and so on are uh, bilingual but you're in that, Tokyo area in Japan yeah I was in Tokyo I was in and Tokyo. what was your mission what was your project I guess to you know to, to accomplish for the company yeah, it was basically to get uh, business software business for uh, for the for the Japanese clients uh, so that they could be offshored and those you know those software projects would actually get developed in India. But then you so know, you have more the, of a sales a sales marketing business development component or more like a, you know create the whole project and and, and yeah and, no. I wasn't really so into the programming side of things as much as I was into like, uh, you know, understanding requirements and then maybe, uh, you know, making sure that uh, my team in India was, you know, doing a good job uh, with. Uh, well, it's hardcore quality. business development in a new country, in the East, new culture. You got to pick yeah. up Japanese, make relationships. Yes. That's pretty yeah. wild. And, you know, talking about relationships, the way Japanese people make relationships is after they get drunk. So the first, yep. <laughs> you have to kind of go drinking with them. And for an Indian woman, to go drinking is really it's kind of out of place you know because indians don't really look at alcohol in a positive way i mean now what are they drinking in india compared to what they drink in japan in the culture like obviously i think japan is more on the sake side of things sake, right? yeah in, in japan would be sake whiskey uh also beer beer japan is pretty big on beer actually um and in india uh, what do they drink usually india, yeah india is also big on uh beer but then also like wine and other uh, stuff uh wine whiskey Rum, gin, um, yeah. But Japan is, um, yeah. It's interesting because people will, you know, after work they will go, you know, if it's a business meeting, then it'll happen after work for the most mm-hmm. for the most part. It'll be mm-hmm. after work, so you finish work, go meet up at one of those uh, uh, izakayas, which is, you know, this like late karaoke? night drinking place. Well, a part of karaoke is also, you know, entertained. So you could do karaoke. You could. I mean, there's other crazy ways of doing business, but I'm just telling you the the more decent ones, um, you know, where you, you basically you loosen up, like the clients mm-hmm. will then loosen up when they start drinking with you. And then you start having the real conversations, you know, and that's mm-hmm. when business deals are made. And um, the next day, you know, if you see those people again, they will be so poker face, you won't like be able nothing to- happen, no? Nothing <laughs> happened, Nothing happened, like nothing. Like what was that? That person I met yesterday, completely different so they keep a different phase for you know their usual work life and then a very different phase for when they're interacting with others and you know doing business and so on and how long were you in japan 17 long years One 17 seven. years wow. in japan <laughs> yes <laughs> 17 pretty, years pretty intense so yeah, so give us a yeah. i mean this is substantial so give us a bit more insights on I guess the gaps between the culture you came from in Japan, more, more a little bit more of the culture shock. Uh, yeah. You mentioned the the poker face at it, 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 mm-hmm. it, work and uh, the release yeah. at night. What, what which other elements did you uh, the, found interesting there? Yeah, so Japanese people are very uh, punctual. They are very, um, I guess, um, uh, they they do what they say. Uh, they they won't kind of uh, they won't kind of lie or mess with you that much. They, they're authentic. You know, they're, 
They're yeah, sincere. That's exactly right. Yeah. So they'll be authentic. They'll be sincere. Uh, things are very clean. They, they don't uh, go about littering the, the, you know, the streets that's and nice. so on. They're very, very clean people. Uh, food is amazing. Uh, you know, language, very polite, extremely polite. Actually, they have different levels of politeness for uh, different types of people that they're talking mm -hmm. to. So for parents, it'd be a different level for a guest, different boss, different coworker, different, you know. Uh, so it's, it's, yeah, it's a very polite society. Um, but I think the things that I really liked about Japan is the convenience of it. Everything is so within uh, reach. Like you can mm -hmm. get on a train, you can get on a bus. You Public transportation is amazing. So you can basically go anywhere in like five or 10 minutes. You can get to the closest bus stop. You can go to any place on train, uh, very well connected by train. Every city is connected by train. Uh, and they have these bullet trains, right? Amazing mm -hmm. speeds. Um, you can connect like east and west in like about three or four hours. You can cross all of Japan uh, by bullet train. Um, and yeah, it's just uh, things happen on time. You know, it's like <laughs> if uh, if a bus arrives even a minute late, you'll be hearing about it from the, the, the bus conductor for a bit. They'll keep apologizing. Like they're apologizing oh. and they're apologizing. We are so sorry we're late. We're so sorry we're late. Uh, and that was such a contrast from India because in India, we have this funny joke. Uh, we we, we, uh, we refer to Indian standard time as Indian stretchable time because, you know, <laughs> if you promise uh, that you'll be someplace at one, it basically means you'll leave home at one and you'll probably be there by two, maybe, <laughs> maybe three. <laughs> So, that is uh, too funny. How how long did it take you to become fluent in Japanese? And did you have a chance to start learning before you got there? Or was it just like you're moving and it's full immersion? It's full immersion. That's what happened. Like I just went best there. Way to learn. You know, yeah, that's the best way to learn. Just like a kid, you know, you just like start babbling and, you know, don't feel uh, afraid or embarrassed uh, by your choice of words because, you know, it's going to come out somehow and people will understand, you know, they'll get it. And you it took me like a two years. Look at the years. mistakes and help you yeah. correct it and you'll pick it up. Yes, exactly. Uh, and, you know, the best way to learn a new language is to watch TV. <laughs> I used yeah. to watch uh, Korean drama in Japanese. So that was like my oh. way. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, because Korean is big, you know, Korean culture is really big in Japan. Uh, and so there's, you know, always you'll have the Korean shows, Korean music, uh, and then they have the localized version of Korean pop uh, in, in Japan. I know so, there's a lot of migration from of Koreans into yes. Japan, and they have their own struggles with society there to fit they in. Do. Yeah, That's exactly. What I kind of understood uh, yeah. the whole thing, but um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, learning Japanese in front of the TV with the dictionary in hand, like I would pause and I would, you know, check the meaning. And, you know, that's how I kind of. And how's your reading and writing in Japanese also for it? Yes, I can read and write. So, I mean, now wow. that I've been away from Japan for about, about seven years, it's getting rusty. Uh, I need, <laughs> need to go back. In fact, I will be going back soon um, for the uh, first uh, Japan mastermind that uh, Gary Huang is organizing. So we'll be there, uh, yeah. You will be there? Awesome. Not myself, our team. Well, yeah, uh, yeah uh, we'll the have some man. team members there. Yeah, that we're seeing the money cool. man, Rob Stanley, and uh, Jim Mann, our head of Europe, uh, he's going to be there. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, uh, you know, really the foundations of my, you know, interest in Japan. It was just that amazing opportunity that I got. And I was like, just so like uh, enamored by the country uh, that I kept getting drawn into it more and more and more. I never thought I'd live there for so long. Like I it never thought. It seems like there you transition between in IIT, your position there into yeah. something else mm -hmm. for, for you know, along these 17 yes, years, right? Yes, yes, yes. So after NIIT, um, uh, actually I transitioned into my own business. I, I started doing e-commerce. I uh, created my own Etsy store. Uh, so I was into, uh, you know, jewelry design and jewelry manufacture. So Etsy I was like, selling in the US or selling in? In Japan? No, sitting in the US, but I was mm -hmm. shipping from Japan, which mm -hmm. basically broke my business. It was like so expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it taught me so much because, you know, uh, when you try to sell anything, you know, it's not just putting up a listing. It just doesn't work. You have to do so mm -hmm. many peripheral things to make things happen, right? So I had to teach myself marketing. I had to teach myself um you know, data and, you know. Uh, you transition full time into e-commerce from your NIT job? 
Yeah, I took a little bit of a break and I worked for a couple of years at uh, uh, a school uh, in the, as a tech, um, you know, tech person in the high school, uh, American school in Japan uh, for about five years. Um, and then I was like, OK, you know, it, it was a, a good transition. And I, I decided to kind of, um, you know, start doing my own thing uh, and um, yeah, I learned so much. And then I, I came to a point where I, I wanted to study more. And so that's when I decided to move to the United States. I moved to the United States for uh, a course in data science. Um, and that was like, yeah, another like six six years ago, I think. Six or seven years ago almost, yeah. So about 2017-ish? Uh, 2016. Uh, I, yeah, 2016. And where would you go? Which uh, location now? I went to, in... Yeah, I went to Seattle. This was my next life. Uh, you know, I, I went to Bellevue College uh, in Washington. And um, well, let me understand this. Let me understand the dynamic of e-commerce. So you started selling yeah. on Etsy. Yeah. Uh, being physically in Japan. Yeah. Uh, selling to the United States market. What year? Yeah. So this was 2010. I started selling. 2010. But all along yeah. the lines, you kept your uh, having day jobs, right? Yes, yes, yes. It was all, always on the side and slowly mm -hmm. grew, grew to a point where I was like, oh, my God, this is so exciting and interesting. I'd rather do this. And so that's when I decided to, you know, really take it seriously and take it to the next level. Uh, and then dived into so many courses. Like I used to listen to podcasts like all the time, like Podcast Junkie uh, started with uh, Facebook. You know, I started learning uh, how to run ads on Facebook, how to, uh, so I, mm -hmm. I used to follow people like Amy Porterfield and gosh, I can't even remember names anymore, but I was a big fan of um, Entrepreneur on Fire, John Lee Dumas. That was my first kind of podcast that I got. Entrepreneur on Fire? Yep, yeah, EO Fire. Mm -hmm. That was probably one of the first, like the earliest podcasts that grew very uh, big and popular very soon. And um, I used to listen to all these entrepreneurs. They were, you know, just talking about how they, um, you know, established their businesses and uh, became successful. And I wanted to be that. I wanted myself to be uh, a so successful. So when you went to Bellevue College in the states, that was in uh, uh, the purpose of that was to grow your e-commerce business. That was the main purpose, or or no? Yeah, the main purpose was actually to go back to school and and study data science properly because I, I in order to develop a career order, there or yeah I wasn't really sure what would happen I took a little bit of a plunge there because uh, I thought okay you know I mean it's my business wasn't really going anywhere because I wasn't really profitable with uh, Etsy uh, more of my sales were you know offline sales you know the, you know people would uh, commission stuff that need, needed to be made for yeah for their events and stuff like that and this so was would, custom jewelry custom jewelry yeah it was mm -hmm. custom jewelry um but then i was like gosh if, if i need to scale this i've got to understand these you know things better so yeah it was just one of those things that timing wise it was perfect i needed to move away from japan also because i thought gosh i can't live here forever like i have to <laughs> i need uh i need an english-speaking country um you know i don't want to even though i could speak japanese i didn't want to retire uh in japan like I, I thought that was that would be too much uh, of like a medical overhead if I let you know let's say if I need medical help growing you know old uh, I wouldn't want to be in a in a Japanese only environment I'd rather be with people who can speak my language so anyway move to the United States and uh, that was by the way far far uh, long term thinking it's interesting it's interesting yeah, dynamic yeah. how you came to that conclusion <laughs> yeah yeah I mean I it makes like... me think right now also. <laughs> But okay, yeah. so 2016, uh, I guess uh, later on the year, you settle in Bellevue, which is Seattle, Washington area. Yeah, yeah. So it was just as a student, actually, for the first year, because uh, I, um, obviously, a student visa, you can't really work there. But uh, you you mm -hmm. can do what is called um, uh, OTP. What, uh, wait, what's the full form again? Gosh, this has been a while. OPT. Optional practical training. That's what it's called. Nice. Yeah, yeah, basically you get uh, you get to work in the United States for one year. So I, I did that. I worked for an e-commerce business uh, selling uh, Amazon seller business. And that's where I jumped into Amazon. And, that's, and that was uh, 2016, 2017? Which yep. year was that? Yeah, that was 2016, 2016. Uh, mm. of, so in order to get by and keep your status in America, Amazon yeah. came knocking on your door saying, hey, here's yeah. a little position for you to stick around <laughs> the country. And that probably changed your life. 
Yeah, I did. Um, unfortunately, though, I didn't get uh, the most kind of coveted uh, H-1B visa, which is like uh, a bummer. Uh, I wish I had um, more luck. But, you know, this is um, this is required to work in Japan. In Sorry, in the United States. Uh, you need, you know, that one year thing is fine. You can do it along with your studies and stuff. But in order to work properly, and get Long term. Paid. Yeah, you you need an H one B visa, which um, apparently the the wait for that is like so like long and big that uh, you know the window opens on first of April every year and it closes in one week. Like all of the uh, yes, applicants. Yes, the demand is demand oh, huge. Like, yes, so they have something like sixty five thousand visas to give away in one year, and they receive more than three hundred thousand applications in one week, and then they close the window. Wow. Now, how do they figure out who they want to pick or not? Yeah. Uh, it's a lottery system. So there is it's a it's a, just a luck thing. If you if your packet gets picked up in the lottery, well then you can, you know, have some chance of getting it. Uh, I mean, this is even before they open the packet, it's the lottery system. So I missed mm -hmm. the lottery first year. Another year, three years in a row, I missed the lottery and did not get picked. So I guess that's fine because you know Canada was right next door. Yeah, that's <laughs> so cool. that's what I did. I moved to Canada. Uh, it was the easiest. Well, it wasn't the easiest, but it was so much easier to get a work permit here. Um, you know, once things started moving, it took about three weeks to get a work permit. Uh, Canada needs people, you know, um, for anyone out there who wants to come to Canada, we need people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they give so, you a jacket when you, uh, when you cross the border. Oh my God. <laughs> No if nothing, if nothing else, a bottle of maple syrup, right? Maple In a welcome syrup. package, a gift card yeah. to Tim Hortons and a bottle of maple syrup should that. be the package. <laughs> yes, the care package, the care package with maple syrup, syrup inside. Yep. No, but Vancouver um, is one of the best cities in the world. It's definitely a yeah. high end city. I am so lucky to be here. Like I've been here now for five years. It is gorgeous. It is just beautiful. Uh, people are amazing. It's the melting pot of like every possible place I've been to. Like uh, there's... Uh, there's all my Indian people here as well as, you know, there's a lot of Chinese people. There's also like Japanese people and um, uh, yeah, it's, it's European just, um, people, French. Yes. European, Australian, uh, you know, there's this whole uh, Whistler area, the very famous ski skiing resort area that, uh, you know, a lot of people from UK, Australia, they practically live there and ski uh, on those beautiful slopes. Um yeah so I'm, so let me get this straight you mm -hmm. uh you kept the job uh with this amazon seller the whole time or what was your professional pathway yeah so then you know things transitioned a little bit and because i moved to canada uh you know i couldn't obviously so i had to find a different path and so it, it it's kind of worked out for me because uh, now I'm, uh, you know, uh, I have the PPC Ninja uh, as uh, one of, uh, yeah, I'm the, one of the three co-founders. And um, it's just been interesting, you know, uh, things are uh, just because of the pandemic, things have opened up so much and so well that I don't have anybody else, no other uh, team member in Canada, except one, yeah, there's one person we've just hired, so he's in Canada. But other than that, my team is global. I How can, many countries would you say? Um, not that many countries, but like India, Philippines, um, Georgia, Bulgaria, and then U.S., Canada, and Japan. Yeah, I have so about six, seven countries. Seven, like. yeah. Yeah, I have team. I have team in Japan as well. Um, yeah. But so, yeah, so let's talk about uh, PPC Ninja because I understand mm -hmm. you know you're working for an Amazon seller. It gave you the experience of selling an Amazon, and when you were selling an Amazon, you were doing kind of everything. Your operations, or you more focused on the on the advertising. What was your dynamic there? And how all of that gave birth to PPC Ninja, if we could touch those, ner those nerves. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so this was, uh, you know, uh, you know, we were working on an all-in-one tool um, back in the day as part of the, the Amazon seller. But then that tool became, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, in a sense, obsolete after a certain time when Amazon removed certain features because Amazon takes away a lot of features, right, that third party tools uh, provide because they do it themselves or they ban it or something. So it was one of those things where, you know, that happened. And so we just extracted the best part of that tool uh, and it was the ad tool and we retained that uh, and then, uh, you know, created the services company around it. And, um, you know, it's... Uh, 
you know, the team has continued to uh, survive uh, the, the transition and has actually grown as well. Uh, so we have the software component, and then I'm also, you know, focused on the services component, which is also pretty big because people don't know how to run their PPC. You know, no matter how good a tool might be, there is still that fear of uh, how do I make my advertising profitable? You know, there's mm -hmm. so many tips and tricks and strategies and things like that. Uh, you have to really uh, keep up with uh, changes. Like Amazon is making changes all the time and they're just giving us presence. Like you can call them presence because we get more and more and more data. But then we have to be prepared to kind of ingest that data, make sense of it, which is kind of pretty nicely aligned with my degree because I wanted uh, that, right? I wanted that understanding from, uh, you know, statistics and, and uh, you know, um, uh, you know, all the, the, the data science. Um, so, you know, it's, it's worked out well. And um, uh, I think the pandemic accelerated things uh, for everybody in the Amazon space. Like it became, you know, so obvious that people were going to shop online and it became obvious to tool companies that this was a great opportunity and, and also services companies, you know, because people always uh, are looking at Amazon as this mm, gold rush, like always like Amazon is looked at the place where sellers will maybe make a million dollars or something like that and so a million dollar business at least i don't know a million, a million dollar profit that takes a little while but it takes um, a little while yeah. i don't understand a little bit of the elements so you moved to canada which year uh so 2017 end of 2017 beginning close to yeah end of 2017 beginning and of what year did you guys i guess uh the, the origins of ppc ninja i know it was like an all-around tool but ppc ninja yes. spun out of that but what year was that when you kind of set up the all-around tool yeah, it was spun out on in 2019 uh, at Prosper Show. Uh, so that was like, yeah, almost like going to be four years ago. Yeah, that was your uh, first market appearance. Yeah, yeah, that the was like as PPC Ninja, we, it was our first market appearance. We actually uh, got a booth and we said, uh, hey, we, right. we have a new We're here. tool. <laughs> We're here. Yeah, I've been That's there, awesome. been there as well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Very good. Okay. So uh, then 2020 kicks in. You can't go to shows. You can't go to trade shows or anything like that. Uh, you're yeah. a year into your you know official uh, launch on the marketplace. And then bo boom, COVID hits. And you're not sure where it's going to go, but you're saying it went well because it went well. You know, e commerce just, uh, you know, boom, they became like the superhero of its time where people are just yeah. stuck at home and you can rely on Amazon to deliver anything you need. Yes. And, um, and advertising became you know, critical to. For, critical. For, Absolutely critical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, if you remember that uh, the start of the pandemic, people, of course, in the beginning, they were like, you know, we're stuck at home, uh, can't go anywhere. There's a little bit of despair and so on. But then there was this spark of, you know, oh, I can do something in this time, you know, I can learn something new. And so there are all of these courses that came out, you know. And so I actually started my mastermind series uh, in the pandemic. Uh, and this was, this is, it continues to this day. I keep running them over and over and over again. This is a four week mastermind that, uh, you know, that uh, sponsored by PPC Ninja, of course, that is free. Uh, for anybody who's got, uh, you know, some basic advertising uh, experience in, in Amazon. And we run these masterminds for four weeks. Uh, we run them live. I personally run these uh, myself. So, and we do it like twice a day to cover the globe. So we do a 10 a.m. session and a 5 p.m. session on Fridays. Uh, and uh, we, we get signups uh, from people around the world. And generally, each mastermind cohort is around 30 to 40 people. Uh, so the morning session, about 30 to 40, evening also around the same amount. And um, what's the name of it? It's just the PPC Ninja Mastermind. Oh, easy. <laughs> I love it. Easy and, and you run it every month or once a year? Uh, you know, in the beginning, I was running it uh, every couple of months. And then I, you know, I ran out of time. So I started doing it once a quarter. But then I realized, gosh, I miss that. Like, I want that connection with sellers. I want to be, you know, helping uh, in that forum. So I brought it back. So now I'm doing it every two months. So I finish one, I get a little bit of a break, maybe two, two three weeks, and then I start again. So I just finished my last mastermind uh, on Friday. And the next one is coming up in March. Uh, so Got it. And, and they could just go visit uh, PPC Ninja Mastermind.com yes. or where can uh, yeah. listeners or viewers uh, uh, tune into this? Yeah, so they can go to PPC Ninja slash PPC Mastermind. There we go. Very good. Yeah, right, go. very cool. I was not aware. That's pretty uh, interesting yeah. and blessed uh, initiative. 
Yeah. And I, I'm sure the more, you know, the more you teach, the more you kind of learn yourself because exactly. you, keep, keep, uh... you keep up. Yeah. And, and you know, the, and that's the time when, uh, you know, I started posting on LinkedIn. Like I, I used to just share whatever, like I wasn't like a social person, like I, social media was not my thing. You know, let's put it that way. I, I was um, a bit too shy to even put my picture up uh, for a long time. I was just using some abstract drawings of myself or just some random uh, stuff uh, as the profile picture but then I realized gosh you know everybody's human like nobody's really there to judge you so much just share what you have to share and and that's it people will figure uh, things out like I used to be so like um, uh, you know not embarrassed, but like aware of my accent, my Indian accent. <laughs> I would be like, oh, but they, you know, they may not think of me favorably. And, uh, and after a while, I was like, nobody cares. <laughs> There's so many <laughs> if accents. If you got the juice and you know all about what you're talking about, does it, you can say nobody any cares. accent. Uh, any accent. Yeah, they'll love accent. you. So it's all yeah, good. Yeah, absolutely. Business. In fact, it becomes a little bit of like a novelty thing, right? To have an Indian accent, uh, speaking English and maybe a little bit of Japanese. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I, I, that's, you know, just the whole pandemic thing opened things up and I started uh, writing a lot, uh, doing my own blog on PP Sinja blog and um, just saw a lot of positive reaction. And so it just kept me going. And so the masterminds we've done, uh, now we've done 29 cohorts, um, you know, almost like back to back, almost back to back. You recommend this wow. to any Amazon seller, especially the ones that do care about advertising, they need it, they need to scale yeah. it, they need to progress in it. That's kind of the, the sweet spot or, yeah, it, or is this more advanced? It, it's not advanced. It's not that advanced. So I would say this is more like the, the intermediate. So let's say you've got your hands dirty with advertising, you've done a few and then you've realized, I don't know this stuff. I, I need help. You know, that's when, you know, this uh, comes really handy because we go into uh, concepts. Uh, and we also show our software, um, but that's not the main focus. The main focus is um, the concepts and showing people how they can do effective advertising. Um, yeah, so... Uh, what about the fundamentals? The, because the fundamentals constantly change. The fundamentals uh, will change. Uh, we, we try to teach some of the um, offbeat topics that most people don't talk about because there's enough material out there at this point on PPC advertising, but we generally talk about ninja tricks, ninja tactics that uh, are simple enough to understand, but if you get it, it becomes so powerful uh, that you know uh, people keep coming back to our masterminds. So the thing is, once you're in the mastermind, you can keep coming back for free. Like every new mastermind we run, uh, we always have like three or four or five people from the from a previous mastermind that that just keep coming back to refresh. And there's some people that have attended six <laughs> six cohorts. Like they keep coming back, you know. And it's funny because I say, hey, you you've already you know this stuff. Like <laughs> why are you coming back? <laughs> <laughs> They need but interaction. They want to keep the finger on the pulse. They enjoy it. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's there's always stuff changing and they probably learn from their other from their cohorts yeah. in it each is. of the courses, right? Like somebody's got yeah. a new, you know, trick or or exactly. made a new mistake that everybody made should avoid. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. And we try to do like uh, homework, like I gave our homework each time so that uh, they have something to think about and munch on. Uh, during the week and then they bring that back and somebody presents and everybody watches the, that. So it's not just me talking, it's other people also kind of sharing their learnings. And uh, there's a lot of Q&A that goes on in that and so many people uh, contribute to answering those questions live. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of fun. And uh, we also created like a Telegram group that goes along with it. So if they didn't catch something, they can always go to the Telegram group and ask there. Uh, people post like, um, you know, screenshots from PPC Ninja software or just any questions around PPC. Uh, it's fun. It's fun. Um, Nice. I, I do that. have a I was, question, I gonna, though. Yeah, go I was going to ask if you had a chat going, but you already answered that question. Sorry, Yoni, go ahead. Yeah. yeah so uh, for the, somebody watching this or listening to this, and they're not too familiar with Amazon advertising and PPC advertising, if you give them, in a, you know, uh, in a nutshell, you know, the evolution of it in the past few years, where was it and where is it now? And what is the challenge? What is the sophistication that sellers and entrepreneurs are facing uh, in, growing on Amazon? Yeah, so I think uh, if, if I compare uh, Amazon today to Amazon five years ago, uh, I think the the amount of competition on Amazon now is crazy high, uh, and uh, people are really uh, kind of uh, kind of fighting to get the the top spots uh, in terms of visibility. 
uh, there used to be a time where organic position number one was actually position number one, no longer. Now it's like it's starting way below the fold. Uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, position eight or nine is now position one, uh, which just makes it like very hard uh, for for most sellers uh, because they have to spend a lot of money to get that advertised spot right up at the top. Uh, so you, you either do a sponsored brand ad, which is a headline ad right across the top of the uh, Amazon search results page, uh, or you do one of the you know four top of search uh, results that sh show sponsored. Now the challenge is that uh, for most shoppers, they can't really tell the difference between a sponsored listing and a regular listing, and they will click on it uh, without realizing, you know, they, they think this is something that Amazon is recommending uh, in response to uh, their search query, which is true. I mean, Amazon is really getting better and better and ma making those matches. But then, you know, that's where the competition comes in because there's so many lookalike products. It's so hard to stand out uh, that, you know, the only way that that, uh, people are able to stand out now is uh, through advertising or some people do it the wrong way which is through uh, gaming uh, the reviews and stuff which is not good at all um, but uh, that's the kind of competition we're up against uh, and it uh, sounds like know, in a nutshell it's more of a pay-to-play kind of reality it is the play is sophisticated you it know is, before it's pay-to-play the yeah. play was simple today the play even the play itself is also complex because of the so many dynamics of DSP there's the brand, there's just the regular sponsored ad. I mean, and it becomes in all these uh, various shapes and forms within the platform and you got to figure it out and have a good coverage in all of them and compete for, with all of them. So mm -hmm. definitely yeah. got to have the pay, but also got to know how to play. Yeah, I, I couldn't put it any better, Yoni. You you said it right. Like this is, uh, it's so pay to play and you, you've got to stay sophisticated and uh, in order to dif differentiate from the crowd and it's becoming harder and harder, which is why there is room for, you know, agencies and um, stuff like that. So we're an agency, right? So there's so many agencies right now. There's, in fact, an abundance of agencies because mm -hmm. people need that sophistication. They and they don't have the time. They're, they're focused on the Amazon business. You know, they don't have the time to learn everything that's there to learn with uh, Amazon advertising. I mean, just look at the number of tools Amazon is producing. They're giving us so many uh, new tools. Like the latest one is the search query performance uh, report. It's got so much stuff. And just to be able to uh, ingest that <laughs> is, it requires a whole team, you know, a, a team effort to get a science all the way. Yeah, it's data science all the way. You download those reports, try to make sense of it, try to figure out how you can extract the best and, you know, well, keep an eye out on your competitors, keep an eye out on, on your keyword ranking. There's so much to keep an eye out for. Yeah. So, Absolutely. yeah, that's the world we are in. Um, yeah, very good. Yeah, it's, it's, I was gonna uh, say it's 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 an overwhelming amount of, of information that a seller would need to know. So obviously they could benefit yes. from using an, an agency like PPC Ninja. So go on ahead and tell us a little bit more about PPC Ninja, and yeah. then we'll do a recap of the episode and let folks know where they can hear more and, and get a message from you. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, PPC Ninja is, um, you know, a, a software and a services company. So we allow you to run your ads your own way. If you want to just use our self-serve platform, it starts at $99. So you can just sign up for it and get started and you know, a couple of hours, all of your data will be imported and you're off to the races. Uh, the second uh, approach would be if you don't want to do it yourself, you want to outsource it to us, uh, we internally will use the PPC Ninja software because that is our secret sauce. Uh, and it is the thing that allows us to, um, you know, give back to uh, sellers in terms of like a, a more reasonable uh, rate because uh, our rates aren't crazy high you know a lot of uh, our competitors charge a percentage of something uh, and they're pretty high you know those rates are pretty high and a lot of people can't afford them uh, so now we've tried to make our uh, value um, value add or value proposition uh, be kind of um, you know leveraged around our own software because we have full control over our software we can make that piece better and better and better so that we can give uh you know the the full kind of attention to the creative side of things because advertising has two sides one is the creative element and one is the data element right the creative element requires humans unfortunately you you can't do away with them you need someone to say okay this is a good ad this is a bad ad this is the, the best kind of strategy mm -hmm. this is a good structure 
So, and then the data science, uh, the data side of things is better suited for software and our automation, your bid, your budget, your placement modifier, those are numbers, right? You can set rules, you can set um, even AI, you can set whatever thresholds you want to say, and then have that run on the side on its own. But the combination of the two is super powerful. And that's what PPC Ninja stands for. We bring that combination of software and uh, you know, human creative brains uh, to the table. And that's what uh, makes PPC Ninja special and different um, from a lot of uh, competitors on the market. Amazing. And if they wanted to learn more, where could they uh, reach you guys at? What, what could they, where could they visit you? Yeah, so they can visit uh, ppcninja.com. That's our website. So it's ppcninja.com. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have, uh, we offer Amazon, of course, that's our core Amazon advertising, DSP advertising. Uh, in addition, we also support uh, Google ads, uh, sending traffic to Amazon, as well as Walmart ads. So those are like the four that we're currently um, concentrating on. Uh, who knows what we might support in the in the future, uh, or we might scale back to just Amazon. We don't know. But at this point, uh, that's uh, that those are our offerings. Definitely check out our services uh, page. Uh, so at ppcninja.com slash services, you'll get uh, a full list of services that we're offering. And uh, like I said, our software, you can get started in under five minutes and, um, you know, test it out um, on the site. Yeah. Incredible. And then if folks have any questions for you about your story, they can connect with you on LinkedIn. That's going to be the best spot. I think so. Yeah, I think LinkedIn is where I'm most active at. So just, uh, you know, reach out uh, to me on LinkedIn, uh, you know, either follow me, friend me or um, send me a message and uh, I'll be happy to, you know, engage with you guys. Uh, it's, yeah. It's always fun. Awesome. Yeah. And for anybody searching for Ritu on LinkedIn, it is R-I-T-U, first name Ritu, last name Java, J-A-V-A. -A. You said you're the only Ritu Java in the world. That's so nice to have a yes. unique name. <laughs> Especially come from, from India, you have 1.4, 1.3 or 4 billion options and you're one of a kind. That's pretty remarkable. Yeah, pretty yeah, yeah. I mean, I can tell you another crazy story and, uh, you know, maybe we can wrap up with that. But my last name is actually from the island uh, Java uh, in Indonesia. Uh, and the thing is that uh, apparently this, this is a pass me down story. I don't know if it's true, but I've heard it from my grandfather. Who must have heard it from his grandfather? I don't know. <laughs> but what I've heard is that somebody or one of their ancestors uh, went from India to uh, Indonesia, which is Java, uh, because there was some sort of like famine or drought or something like that. And it was uh, very hard for them to survive. And so as, you know, as a survival thing, they, they, they crossed the ocean and went over. Uh, and then uh, I think uh, they came back uh, after a few decades. And once they came back, they were uh, they were given the last name Java because they came from Java. Came from Java and, yeah, so that's the reason why there is no other... <laughs> Uh, I mean, there, uh, the only other JAVAs I know of in in, in uh, India are my own cousins, uh, uh, and then of none which of them, there are many. Of uh, which there are many. <laughs> like I have fifty plus cousins, but um, yeah, there's only one uh, first name Ritu. Uh, so that's 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 what makes my name unique in the world. If there is any other Ritu Java in the world listening to reach this, out, reach out to yeah, reach out to me. I would love to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing. So we're going to do just kind of, kind of a quick recap of the episode. Um, and then we'll want to hear one final piece from you, a message of hope or inspiration for entrepreneurs out there. So I uh, grew up in Delhi, India. Appreciate the history lesson on that. I had no idea that everything was kind of all the same now. I uh, grew up in Delhi, India. Mother was a doctor. Father was a professor. Uh, you actually have gone to school to be an engineer, kind of one of the other esteemed um, occupations in India at the time. Uh, ended up getting a job at NIIT in the early 90s, which helped, if I understood correctly, kind of teach students JavaScript and also help with offshoring software development. Uh, worked there for a number of years from the 90s into the 2000s, during which you actually did a quick little visit over to the US and Atlanta for six or nine months. Uh, an assignment at IBM went back home and then actually moved to Japan. So you went from Atlanta back to India and then moved to Japan in the early 2000s, continuing to work at NIIT doing business development. That was the motivation to move there. Uh, lived in Japan for 17 years total. And somewhere in the meantime, ended up doing some teaching at an American high school in Japan, also started selling on Etsy, which proved difficult shipping to the US, selling jewelry into the US. Um, 
But ultimately, around 2016, decided to come back to the U.S. to study data science, formerly at Bellevue College in Washington State. Uh, got a job with an Amazon seller through, you said it was OPT, optional practical training. So through your student visa, you couldn't officially work, but it sounds like if you were doing something that was related to your field of study, you could work for a year. Um, and then unfortunately, after a few years of not getting the H-1B visa in the US, decided to pop upstairs, I guess we can call it, to uh, <laughs> Vancouver and have been there uh, since about late 2017, early 2018. Uh, started PPC Ninja officially, Prosper Show 2019, and have been running that ever since. And like you said, you're a software and a, um, and a services provider and also are doing your mastermind on the side as well. So we've given the links where folks can find those. Is that kind of an accurate wrap up of everything? Oh my goodness. I haven't heard anyone <laughs> summarize things so well, Lisa. You're just so amazing. You're listening carefully, taking notes. Yeah, that's absolutely, uh, you know, sums it up beautifully. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for sharing us. It was uh, fascinating. Yes. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So, so now with your story and your experience in mind, what would be your piece of hope or I'm sorry, a message of hope or inspiration for entrepreneurs out there listening? Short and sweet. Short and sweet. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, keep an agile mind, I would say, you know, don't be stuck with uh, thinking that this is it. Like there's always a new life waiting for you. Uh, and that's what happened to me. Like I've moved four countries. I have, you know, taken different jobs, different, you know, career switch careers, like, you know, fought against governments literally to get, uh, you know, immigration. And so nothing deter has deterred me primarily because of the agile mind. Uh, so yeah, mm -hmm. keep an agile mind, keep, uh, you know, keep your options always open. There's always something better ahead. If you yeah, want to be and, a good ninja, dive in. Keep an agile mind, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and dive in feet first. You seem to have gusto with everything you do. It's like we're going to go to Japan, and I'll yes, learn yeah, it when I get well. there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Amazing, Richie. Thank you so much for chatting with us today, sharing your story. It was really wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you, Yanni. It was a great pleasure being here together. Yeah. Amazing, thank and thank you, everybody out there watching and listening. Stay safe and healthy, and we will see you on the next one.